Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop and you just missed the most epic belch by my wife. It was totally prize winning and uh, yes, she's smiling at me now. <laughs> So um, we're going to do a Q&A this week. We went through a bunch of uh, tenons, and I try and do a Q&A once a month, every other month or so. And I think it was about time. So if anyone has any questions, go ahead and throw them down in the live chat. <laughs> I can't find anything more I would to talk about. Um, oh, if you're not watching this live, go ahead and look down in the description now, and I'll leave a link to all of the questions that have been asked and a timestamp that gets you relatively close to where they are in the video, uh, so you can quickly jump to that, hopefully. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, I am going to be announcing, oh, we do have the, the winner for last week's... Well, just, well, no, they're, 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 it's the same topic. We have a winner for last week's uh, Strop giveaway, and the question was, how many Strops have I sold so far? And it is 278, I think it was, as of this morning, or as of when I asked the question. Um, and the closest question was Tyler Stevens, which, what's that? Our answer. Uh, question, closest qu answer, yes. Yes. <laughs> I think he had uh, 230 some, but the next closest was 500. So, um, yeah, um, everyone was under except for two people. One was like 500 and something, one was 600 and something. Yes, um, I've been selling a lot of strops, um, and I actually just made up some more this week. Uh, I've been the the sales have slowed down a little bit, so I can kind of keep up with it. So if you're interested, in it, they're out for sale in my shop. Um, and we give away on the channel the thirds. Um, so I sell the regular ones that are whole. I sell seconds, which are whole, but they might have a blemish or a color, but functionally they're the exact same. And then I also sell thirds that are always missing like a corner or some piece like that, but functionally it's still a good piece of horse hide butt. Um, and yes, it is horse butt. Um, and they're a lot of fun. So if you want to see those, you can go to woodbyright.com. Uh, but we are going to do the giveaway for the, the next week's. So if you aren't watching this live, if you're watching recorded, we're going to do the giveaway right now. Well, we're going to be telling you what the giveaway is. Um, and you, once it goes live, so those of you, once it, once it goes unlive, once the video comes up as a regular video <laughs> and you have the, the, the chat, uh, you have the, uh, the comments down below, um, I'm going to throw this out this week, and the person who puts the suggestion in the comments for what next week's project will be gets a strop. Uh, so if you have a joint you'd like me to see, throw it down there. Uh, maybe you have some project you'd like me to do, and I'm thinking about possibly doing a project step by step through the lives, um, doing something like a shelf unit or um, maybe a stool or a box, something of that nature. Um, put a suggestion down in the comments once the video comes out, and I will pick one of them from the comments, and whoever puts the suggestion down there that I pick will be getting a strop in next week's video when we start the project or joint or whatever we're doing. So, uh, yeah, for those of you who aren't live and uh, who are live, <laughs> just wait until the video goes out, and then you can comment down below. If you see me and I am typing at the same time, and it does not say, <laughs> not um, Holy full of questions. Okay, well, I was going to say, if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in there because we're going to be doing a Q&A, but if they have questions, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> um, other things before we close this out, um, April 14th, coming up around the corner, we're going to be having the Midwest Tool Collectors Association here in Loves Park. It's just a couple miles away from me, and I'm really looking forward to going to that one um, because I, I help host that one. So if you're coming out to it, I'd love to see you. Say hey, and uh, feel free to come up and, and talk. Um, I will be at the Nationals in June, and the um, invites for that should be coming out soon. So if you become a member to the Midwest Tool Collectors Association, you'll get an invite to one of these meets. You do have to be a member to come to the meets, um, and then there is an entrance fee, but it is the best place by far to buy tools um, anywhere in the world. So the National is, okay, imagine for, yourself, imagine for a moment an entire basketball court completely covered in tables, and all those tables completely covered in hand tools for sale. That is just one half of the sale. The other half is outside in the parking lot where everyone backs their trucks up and they sell tools out of the back of their trucks and vans. Um, you get some really good deals that way. So I'm looking forward to that. That's the national coming up in June. Um, and I will also be speaking at that one. So looking forward to seeing you for that. Um, and then before June in May, uh, we are going to be in, uh, in UK. 
my wife and I are going over to Maker's Central. So this should be kind of a fun thing for those of you who are um, able to make it to that. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. So we got the London Pass. So you all need to tell me <laughs> what we need to see. We're going to the Fort Plain Gallery. I'm sorry, a nurse, you, you just took the passage. Sorry. Anything else? Yeah, we're, we're making our itinerary and figuring that out. So, um, yeah. Um, so if you have suggestions, don't put them in the live chat. Put them down in the, the comments down below when the video goes out. Um, and just as a note, I'm probably going to be moving these over soon, moving the lives over to the second channel soon. Um, so if you want to keep up on the lives, go ahead and subscribe to Wood by Write 2. Um, I'm going to be moving the lives over to Wood by Write 2. Um, so I have Wood by Write and Wood by Write 2. Wood by Write is the big one. And that is becoming more and more a YouTube channel that is made for YouTube people. And so that's the, the, the easy to watch um, float through videos that a lot of people like to watch through. Um, whereas Wood by Write 2 is becoming more of what I want to put out the content thick um, where I go into more detail and I talk about what I'm thinking and why I'm doing it that way and actually talk through joints and explain things as well as just showing them. Uh, so I'm probably going to be moving this over to Wood by Write 2 sometime here. So go ahead and uh, hop on over there if you would like to see these more. It'll probably be a month or so. I'm just letting people know ahead of time so when I make the jump, um, I don't leave a lot of people in the dust. Um, but I think that's about it for comments. I think I've talked long enough, haven't I? <laughs> what do we have for questions, babe? Yes, I have my brand out for making straps. I like the voice, babe. Oh, and for the first time in a long time, um, Sarah isn't completely sick. I know, isn't it? No coughing the head off today. Don't jinx it. <laughs> what we got? We'll, we'll, we'll say it's for my hot chocolate from Alan, you know? Yes. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> well, I had to treat myself at work because, you know. I got you Chinese tonight. You did get me Chinese. You did get me Chinese. <laughs> All right. Just me or a picture fuzzy? Oh, it might be a little bit. Let me go just adjust that while she's talking. I sound a bit quiet. I have no yeah, you're a little ways away from the mic. <laughs> yeah, you you were leaning back when you were talking about your sickness. You're a ways away from it, so. <laughs> so what do we got for questions? I'm hanging. I'm hanging. She's adjusting her phone. Did I turn your mic? Oh, oh shoot! I turned your mic down. That's why. Never mind. That was my fault, not her fault. Here I am blaming my wife. Let's try this. Ah, now you can talk. Okay, I feel a little love though that they actually wanted me to have a mic. So that thanks, guys. <laughs> um, I hope that's better now. Round two of hot chocolate on me. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> How about now? Can you me now? All right. Uh, let's see. First question. Robert Sparkman had the first question, and well, okay. So Robert Sparkman had one, and then Don Davis had one. And they're kind of together. So here. So the first one was, what's the best way to make a groove for a drawer bottom? And then the follow-up question was, how to make a consistent groove for a drawer bottom without a groove plane? Ah. So I don't know if that's cool. Well, the I do same have, or different. I do have a couple of videos on making oh, a... Thank you, Alan. Oh! <laughs> My thing just started jumping around on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do have a video on making grooves without a grooving plane, um, and I'll try and link those when I put the things out, but, uh, oh, before we get this, there's a joke, uh, because someone put up a, li a, a super chat, they oh, get a joke here. Oh, you better here. make it worth his while. Um, what's that Nevada city where the dentists like to visit? It's Las Vegas? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Alan. I like telling those jokes. <laughs> um, back to the grooving plane. Um, the easiest way is a grooving plane. And honestly, um, this was like the second or third tool that I ever made. And it's a grooving plane. And I made it with a quarter inch chisel. Um, most people can make one of these in 
uh, two to three hours. Uh, really, they don't take much time. So if you don't have one of these and you have a half inch chisel, you can make a grooving plane really quickly. And this is probably a video I should do sometime. That might make a good, uh, a good live video, maybe making one of these live. Um, but uh, you can make a grooving plane relatively quickly that will make grooves really nicely. And this is something that's always set up. Anytime I need to make a quarter by quarter by quarter groove, I can just pull this out and I'm good to go. Uh, if you don't have that, then you can saw out the two sides and then move out the waste in between. It, uh, it sounds really difficult to make those saw marks, but it, it's really not. Uh, especially if you have a knife wall for the saw to ride in, it, it goes pretty quickly. Um, and if you want to see more specifically what I'm talking about that, I have several videos on how to cut a groove without a grooving plane. Um, actually, I think I have an entire live where I went into that detail and I even showed making a curved groove. Uh, but basically, you're cutting down the walls with a saw and then chiseling it out. Um, you can do it without the saws and just um, uh, chop in and you actually make a relief cut and then you come in with a plane and clear out and you chop down again, you clear out and you chop down again, you clear out until you get the groove down to the depth you want. It's a little bit slower that way, um, but it does work. You can do it with just a chisel. So yeah, thank you, that was a good question. All right, so very serious question for this next one from Kevin Rich. What is your favorite type of M&M? &M? <coughs> blue. Blue m m They taste better than any other time. <laughs> there are so many options now. <laughs> um, uh, probably dark chocolate. I like dark chocolate m &Ms. Straight dark chocolate. Yeah. He really just good. likes dark chocolate. Dark chocolate m &Ms. Although they do make now a pretzel m m that has a pretzel core and a Ooh. chocolate outside. Those are Ooh, pretty good, too. That sounds good. Or caramel. <laughs> or all. No. The, the one with the nuts inside. Peanut? Yeah, but. You like the peanut? peanut I no. like, the, yeah, the no, no. For me, it's, it's probably the dark chocolate. The M&M's are not my favorite candy. Yeah. But anyway. I, I would prefer Reese's Bits. Those are those are better. Sarah doesn't. I don't like peanut butter. She doesn't like peanut butter chocolate. Too. All right, moving on. <laughs> um, Evan St. Cyr. St. Sire, I don't know. I hope I'm saying that right. Hey, I'm a very young beginner woodworker. What are some basic beneficial projects that I could pull off? <laughs> um, usually I tell people the first thing you need to build is a bench and that kind of scares people off because there's a lot of joinery and it seems complicated and it's big. Um, but big joinery is relatively easy because the bigger the joints are, the easier it is to hide a gap. I mean, little gaps on a big piece don't show up as much as little gaps on a little piece. Um, and so the, the, the joinery, it's a great place to learn. And even if your joints are a little bit sloppy because they're so big and there's so much surface space, um, you can make a really sturdy bench even with somewhat sloppy joints. Uh, and once you learn all the steps you need <laughs> to make a bench, you can make anything else. And it, it's a great way to learn. And it's, it's a project that you can look at for the rest of your life and not everyone then has to be staring at it in the living room. So I generally tell people the bench is the first thing you gotta build. Um, and there's probably gonna be some tools you have to make along the way to make the bench, like winding sticks or a grooving plane or something like that, a mallet. Uh, and those are projects that you make to make the bench. When I was making my first one, I made a mallet to make um, a plane to make the clamps to make the bench top to make the bench. Uh, <laughs> So sometimes you have to go through all these, and that was just because I had a very limited set of tools. I started, when I started working on my first bench, I had a set of chisels, a panel saw, um, and uh, a hand plane, a number four hand plane. Um, and I got more as I progressed, but that's all I needed to get started. Um, if not that, then probably like a side table. The joinery on a side table, there are a lot of little different things you can put together, and I have a whole detailed series on building a side table where I think it's like eight videos long, each one's a half hour where I go into detail on every joint and every application of it, um, as well as plans available on my website. Those, uh, that is a great project because you can get through a lot of things. Um, some people are thinking, wow, that's even too complicated. Well, then make a cutting board. Um, making a board flat and true is a difficult task. And if you can do that with a board, then a lot of other things become very easy. So um, that's, you know, that, that's a good beginner's step. But, Pretty much any project out there is a good beginner's thing. If you want to make a Queen's Anne high boy, go for it. Will it be the best one ever made? No. Um, but I can guarantee you when you're done, you'll have all the skills you need to build anything else. Uh, just take it step at a time and learn each step as you need it, and you'll get all the way through it. Not a problem. 
What's next? Uh, Sorry, that's one of my tirades you caught me on. Pretty much. That's okay. I'm like way behind the chat, and they're probably saying all sorts of <laughs> funny stuff. <laughs> she may not I be don't sick, like but she's loopy. butter and chocolate. I'm sorry. <laughs> or mint and chocolate. Your mint is to brush your teeth with. That's it. Anyways, Mike Bordeaux asks, is there any reason why not to use a brace and bit to drill out the bulk of a mortise and then finishing it up with a chisel? Um, on thin mortises, in other words, like half inch or thinner, I rarely, rarely bore them out. Um, I find that to just take more time than chiseling down because you have to make more holes across and you have to be far more careful with those that they don't go out of line. Uh, I find it to take more time to bore out on thin, um, on, on thin tenons. So, yeah, anything a half inch or smaller, I, I don't bore those out. But bigger ones, like the, <coughs> the joinery on my bench, the half inch, and uh, the, excuse me, the, the one inch, um, or on my other one, I had inch and a half tenons. Um, I've had a few that are like two inch tenons, and then you get into um, framing, uh, like uh, um, timber framing, there's a word. Then you're going to be getting you know, two inch, three inch tenons. Um, and for those, it's, just, it's quicker to auger out than, than bringing out all the material. Um, and that's why using a, uh, using a beam drill is very useful in timber framing. Um, so bigger mortises and tenons, yeah, I argo those out. Smaller ones, it just takes more time because there's a lot more holes you got to drill and a lot more finesse. Um, little holes just don't help as much as chopping out the, ch the chisel. So. But it's a personal opinion. Some people really like hoggering out even like quarter-inch tenons. Oh, well. Um, excuse me, quarter-inch mortises. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. personal choice. What else? Um, okay, hang on. I'm hanging. I need Shush. a bar. You know what? Hush. <laughs> Fishing Hush up. says, or asks, is, oh, I lost it. Is the best first power tool a table saw or band saw? Um, for me, the best power tool is actually a thickness planer. Uh, the part that takes the most time when working with rough... <clears throat> Working with rough material is, is planing it all down. Um, that's why the bed that I have coming up, um, I just got all the stock back from the planer. Um, I, 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 I have 100 board feet that I was going to do. And in the past, I've done it all by hand, and I can do that. And I had four days booked out for planing it all down by hand and making a lot of curls. Um, you know, an hour or two of thickness planing by hand, not a problem. Um, Four hours of thickness planing by hand, uh, three days of thickness planing by hand, oh, especially in white oak. Um, running it through a thickness planer just makes it so much easier. That's why that would be my suggestion for first tool. Um, everything else, I find it to be, eh, you know, a table saw maybe. I, I think I would do a table saw second, and then a third would be a, a band saw. I, I really haven't had a whole lot of chance for a bandsaw. Although I guess you could rip on a bandsaw, so you could do the table saw work on a bandsaw. Um, but first on my list is a power planer. So, yeah. What? It's a good thing I'm short, because woo, that <laughs> I was here for the comments, not necessarily. You're just here for the food. That's <laughs> yeah, a good thing you bought Chinese. All right. <laughs> That's what I'm talking mm, about. I bought you Chinese. <laughs> okay, before I forget, Alan wants me to have you mention a website that has multiple joint projects for the beginners. Do you know what he's talking about? I do not. No. There are Sarah? a lot of sites oh, out there. Oh, your website. Ha ha. Oh. That yeah. has multiple I was going to say, there's projects. a lot of websites out there that are devoted to beginner projects. I can read. Um, it's all good. But yeah, I have a lot of uh, plans on my site where I, I go through it. And most of them are beginner quality type projects, nothing really complicated. Even the big table that I just made, uh, yeah, it's big and massive, but the joinery on it is dead simple. There's, there's not much to it. It's a really easy project to do. It's just big timbers, so it looks complicated, but it's not. All right, so Robin Lehman asked, or says, Hey, James, I just bought an old tongue and groove plane. How do we tune those up so that the reference faces line up? It cuts, but the reference edges are off by a millimeter. Um, it depends on which style you have. Um, 
if, if you have like the uh, the swing arm like the Stanley 48, uh, you can have like this one here. Let me sh show you this one a little bit lower. And this one it has a little less flexibility into setup. Move that over. There we go. And over to two, a two. There we go. So this one has a swing arm, so you can flip it over and you can do. Uh, in this case, it's doing the groove, and in this case, it's going to do the tongue. Uh, so it moves the fence over, and the the distant the things that matter are your fence, so the the surface that rides against the side of the board, from there to the edge of your cutter. Um, so in this case the distance from the fence to the distance to the edge of the first cutter and then the distance from the first cutter to the second cutter um, if that makes sense so right now it this fence has a quarter inch from the fence to the first edge of the cutter and then a quarter inch from the first edge of cutter to the second edge of cutter and then another quarter inch from the edge of the cutter to the third edge of the cutter um, and so in this case there isn't a whole lot of adjustability because everything is locked in and built to the frame of this. Most of the time it's going to do with tapping your blade back and forth. Um, if you don't have a solid reference surface for the blade to sit against, you can grab you can grab a, uh, a plane adjustment mallet and tap the iron one way or the other. Did I cut myself? Oh look at that, I just sliced myself somehow. Apparently it's something so around here sharp. sharp. That's why. I, don't know. <laughs> I just saw red and I thought marker. No, it's not a marker. It's actually blood. No, um, like so a little bit of tapping one way or the other on the iron and you can actually adjust where it goes. But without knowing your particular style because there are a lot of different tongue and groove planes. Um, in this case, I have a video a while ago where I actually made a tongue and groove <coughs> set. Um, and so this one is a grooving plane and then I made a tonguing plane that matches it. Um, and so in this case, Nothing is actually securing this iron. I actually have to adjust the iron in and out side to side in order to get a nice clean cut. Um, so that's what I just have done here. So, yeah, um, mostly it's just to do with moving that iron where it needs to be. Um, measure off where it needs to be and tap it around. But there really isn't that much that I can, I can help you unless you have a specific plane in mind that I have, then I could show you. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> What else we got? Hang on. She's typing. Uh, <sighs> now she's humming. That's not humming. No, I'm distracting her. That is, I don't know. Uh, Jack Murphy. How, oh, whoa, that's really. <laughs> How do you research certain tool makers? I cannot find much information on New Haven Edge Tool Company for my draw knife. <laughs> um, if it's not Stanley, Miller Falls, or one of the other main uh, companies, they get hard to find. Um, and so if, if I need to look up some particular company like that, um, I usually try and find a collector. And the easiest way for me to do that is to contact a few people I know in the Midwest Tool Collectors Association. Um, and usually someone out there is a collector of that particular brand. And I find that person and they have done a ton of research on the factories where they were made and the history behind them. Um, and a lot of that information doesn't really exist anywhere but in that person's brain um, because they've done all the research to make it happen. And so particularly for yours, you're, you're going to need to find a collector. I don't know anything about it. Um, and I, yeah, <laughs> there is no one site for all of it. Um, but if you want to find out more, the Midwest Tool Collectors Association website has a ton of background information on tools. Um, MWTCA.org. Uh, they, uh, they have a whole lot of patent searching information as well as company searching information. And... Most of the collated information on tools is, exists on that website somewhere. It is a very hard site to get around, um, but you're, if you spend some time digging around, you'll probably find some reference on there or at least a connection to someone who might collect that particular company. Um, or what I normally do is I go to one of the meets and I walk around to people and say, hey, you heard anything about this company? Or do you know anyone who collects this company? I'll ask you know, a dozen people and finally someone says, oh yeah, Bob over there, I think he collects that. Um, and then I can go find out more information on that. 
But a lot of times there are companies out there that no one knows anything about. They don't know when they made tools. They don't know where they made tools. They don't know anything about it. The, the company just disappeared. Um, especially when you get into things like uh, forging, um, anvils. Uh, there's a ton of information out there that just doesn't exist. No one knows. Um, it's lost to history. So, yeah. But getting to know different people, the Midwest Tool Collectors Association is the best place to go for that type of information. Apparently you sound like Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson? Which Who's I that? Don't. He's an actor. I know. Uh, He's got a crooked I follow view. actors really closely. Oh, night, night at the Museum, the Cowboy. That's who he's talking ah, about. Ah, okay. Yeah, see? Yeah, I got you. Ah! Anyways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't know names. Um, but apparently you have a very shiny head, and what was there? There was another color. Yeah, I know. My hair's getting long. I need to shave it. It's, it's summer now. I can actually start shaving it again. Anyways. L unless you're referring to my wife, but I don't think you are. Oh, my. I'm getting the look. <laughs> <laughs> Head shiny, forehead. I don't know. That's a stretch. Yes, like. <laughs> Anyways, I'm not the one who has a glare right this second. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> you, you, I, how you still are? You're alive. glaring at me. I, how you're still alive? I don't know. <laughs> it's because you threw a chocolate from a safe distance. But anyway, <laughs> even I'm gonna say this wrong. Gagnon. I'm, I'm sure it's like a really cooler pronunciation. Pronunciation. That. Anyways, hello from Pencil, Central Florida. How? Where do you live? I don't at recall hearing that. I am in Rockford, Illinois. Well, actually, I'm in Chesney Park, Illinois, which is just north of Rockford. But basically, um, top center of Illinois, right on the state line. We're uh, what five miles south of the Wisconsin border. So yeah, Rockford, Illinois. Having fun here. At least it won't take a lot to shave. <laughs> No. And if you are in the area, let me know. Maybe we can hang out, uh, especially if you're coming to the uh, tool meet. But I don't think you're coming up here from Florida, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Although if you want to, there are people who drive literally six, seven hours, get a hotel, um, who come out for a, you know, a tool meet that lasts three or four hours. Uh, because a lot of times that's the only place you can find the tools. All right, let's see. Next question. Alan Smith, has a, he's got two. Ah. First question, when will James start on the bed project? Also, what are the next techniques does he plan to teach? Um, hopefully the first video on the bed project will be coming out Saturday. Um, I've got a little bit more I need to do for that um, and, and hopefully it will become the Saturday video for a while now. Um, I have the, the pieces are all milled up to length um, and sitting on the floor underneath the camera right now. And uh, I've been just, I, I, I was going to have the video come out last week, um, and that was my intention because I was planning on milling everything by hand, and I would have had it done then, but I decided to take it out and take it to the planer, um, and it saved me actual time in the shop, but it meant it was going to take longer um, to get the next video out. So it's been off a little while, but hopefully it'll be coming out Saturday. It'll be the, the first video on the, the bed. Um, what was the second question? What joinery? Hang on. Next techniques you plan to teach? Um, I usually bring up whatever happens to be coming up in the work. Um, so in this, I'm going to be doing a lot of sliding dovetails. I'm going to be doing some <laughs> panel installation. I'm going to be doing a lot of through tenons. I've got a, um, I've got an idea because usually the rails on a bed come through and then you put a tusk, a tusk tenon in them um, so that they, they don't come out. And I wanted to do a drawbar tenon to hold the pins in place, but I want to make it removable, and you, you, you really can't get drawboard tenons out. Um, so I'm actually going to be making a, steeled, a steel pinned tenon, um, but making it horseshoe shoe shaped. So rather than just being one pin, it'll be two pins that are a solid unit that drive through to hold the tenon in place. And I've never seen anyone else do one quite like that before, so it should be kind of interesting. But that will be the that'll be the the big interesting joinery in the bed project. Um, other than that, I'm probably going to be doing a little bit more turning here soon, as I got the lathe out. Uh, I'm getting ready to do a talk in um, uh, just outside of Lacrosse, if I remember correctly, um, at a, a tool 
um, gathering up there. That's April 20th, I think it was. Yes. Um, so I'm looking forward to taking that up there. But that won't be a video. That'll just be for the local people in uh, La Crosse or LaGrange or La Crosse. I think it's La Crosse. Yeah, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Cool. What is next? <laughs> um, oh, hang on. You've got lots of questions, so stop talking so much. Uh, Justin Ford wants to know, it's a two for one. What furniture makers slash designers inspire you or that a newbie should research and or I should say? <laughs> um, I really am inspired by uh, early 1920s. Uh, the the mission slash arts and crafts style because um, there's, there's mission arts and crafts and um, craftsmen that are all very similar and a lot of times the names are very swappable between those three and they, they kind of view this whole genre of woodworking where the joinery is, is shown there's a lot of through tenons they're square shapes um, it's relatively easy things to make. There isn't a lot of curves or complicated things to it. They, they tend to be right angles. And so that type of joinery is very easy for the beginner to, to, to do and to jump into. Um, and then you can take it a little step further with green and green and they start making cloud lifts and other things like that. Uh, and I really like that, that style. Um, a lot of my favorite inspiration and things that I, I would like to do in the future and have pulled a few pieces out of is actually um, medieval easy uh, what is it medieval rustic furniture um, and it's not like yeah, rustic as when we think of it of having logs and things like bed? that oh the kids are coming down <laughs> um, but it's rustic as in that it flows with the wood the the boards are not flat um, they were yes. split out of a log and you start to see the undulation and curve of the twist in the log um, and you see a lot more of that nature coming into it and that that is really inspiring to me so um, I have a, a few projects rolling around the back of my brain I really want to do sometime um, but I haven't quite gotten there so we'll see how that goes but yeah that that's what inspires me what's next oh Sharif Schwan asks, planning on visiting Wales while you're over? Ah, no, I would love to. Um, there's a lot more we'd like to see, but no, we're, we're going to be, uh, well, we're, we're flying into London and we're doing, uh, a couple days before we're going to do the, um, we're going to go down to Portsmouth and see uh, HMS Victory. Um, I love looking at the, 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 the woodworking on that. We're going to go to Dover. We're going to do a little bit in London. Um, and then we're going up to Maker's Central, which is in um, Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham. And uh, then coming back down to London, our last two days will just be in London, um, doing the London Pass kind of things. So I would love to do Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland particularly is, is a place I'd like to. There's a, there's a lot of um, the, the Irish... Um, medieval design is very interest, intriguing to me. Um, the Scot Scottish too. Uh, that, that whole feel is very, very intriguing to me. But not in this trip. We'll be out there again someday. <coughs> we better. <laughs> That's all I got to say. What's next? Uh, Kermit dude. Sounds a little green to me. Uh, hey. You can do the dad jokes. I can do whatever I want to. A question about dimensions. When starting a project, do you plan the sizes of every piece slash subassembly in SketchUp or just the overall size facing the subassemblies off the resulting carcass? Um, if I am making plans to sell, I will detail out the entire thing in SketchUp beforehand. Um, I don't do that for myself. I do that because I have plans that... I need to be able to transfer information from my brain to other people. And so because of that, um, SketchUp is, is how I'll do that. Um, it's not my preferred CAD program. I really prefer AutoCAD. That's what I was raised on. Um, but I, um, SketchUp is what's more common for other people. Um, if I'm building things for myself, I don't plan anything out. Like when I made my coffee table, um, I had the biggest piece was the piece of glass. And so I had to work my wood around that. So the glass determined the size of the top. 
And so I made the pieces off of that and whatever length it came out to is whatever length it came out to. I didn't even measure it. I just put the piece of glass on there and marked here and marked here and that's the length of it. And then everything was built off of that. I, I, when I made the coffee table, I didn't measure a single thing on it. Um, I would just hold up the work that I needed to measure it to and cut the board to that length. Um, there literally were no measurements in the whole construction of it. Um, I just started with the one big piece that everything was built off and went from there. Um, with the dresser, it was very similar. Um, the, I did have to make a measurement in the dresser because I wanted it to fit into a specific spot on the, in the bedroom. So the bedroom, I need had a length of the dresser. It had to be this long. So I cut the table to, uh, the countertop to that. Uh, well, actually, I didn't cut the countertop first, but I, me I figured if it has to be this long, we need an inch of reveal on either side and then an inch for the corbels. And so that's the length of the actual cabinet. And so I cut my stretchers at that. And then everything else was built, built off of that measurement. Um, I, for the height, I said, I cut the board here, and I thought, mm, that's a little too tall, and I put in a mark a little lower, and I cut it here, and mm, yeah, that's right. So I took that leg, and then I laid it on the other three legs and cut them to whatever that was. Um, there was no measurement involved. It was just, that feels about right. Um, and that, that's the way I like to work. I, I don't like working off of plans, um, but the only way you can transfer information from one person to another person um, who's not right there in the shop using the same boards you're using is putting it on plans. So that's why I, I do that. But for my personal use, I, I never I, I never plan anything out like that. Just not worth it <laughs> for me. What's next? <clears throat> Woodcraft Journey. Do you ever use the pole lathe? Watch the build but haven't seen you seen much with you using it. Um, I went away. When I first had it up and running, I did a bowl, I did a bunch of handles, I did some spindle turning. Um, I probably did, uh, what, a dozen or so projects that I made videos for. Um, but the problem is the lathe takes up so much space in the shop that I just can't have it always out. So I disassemble it instead in the corner, and it's been in the corner for a while. I just haven't had any need for it. There aren't a lot of projects that call for it. Um, I had a project coming out, which hopefully will be... Uh, next Thursday's video, it might be this Thursday's video if it cures in time, we'll see. Um, but I had the, the spring pole lathe pulled out for that, so hopefully you'll be seeing it here soon. And then I have a couple other little projects that I want to do with it, but uh, we will see. I, I, I don't have a whole lot of need for turning. Um, it doesn't fit into my aesthetic as much as other things. And the pole lathe is, is not a lathe for making things. Um, for some reason, people think that I built the lathe so that I can make things. I, I didn't. Um, number one, I built the lathe so that I could show a pole lathe because they're a lot of fun to show off. Um, but the biggest reason for making it is the thing is so much fun. And I don't care what I'm making on it. I'm just going to turn something on it and, and make curls uh, because it's incredibly enjoyable. Uh, messing around with the, with the pole lathe is, is, is half the fun. And this particular one was originally designed in... Um, in Hungary, and uh, I think it was Hungary, um, but it was designed to be a hobbyist's lathe. Um, so the arist aristocracy that wanted something to do um, made this lathe so that they could mess around and have some fun. It wasn't a lathe designed for production use. Um, it was a, des a lathe designed to enjoy um, and to experiment with. So yeah, that's kind of the way I use it. <laughs> One of these days, once I get a, I want to have an outdoor shop someday, and this, the lathe would be set up in there as well as having a shave horse and a few other things that would work really well in an outdoor space. Um, and then eventually I would like to have a flywheel lathe so I can actually do some regular turning, but I don't have that yet. So next time. What else we got? <coughs> okay, uh, Jacob Meadows. How were the soles of complex molding plane shaped traditionally? You carve them. That's about it. <laughs> um, when If you had a company that was regularly making planes, they would have a master plane, um, or what they called the mother plane. Um, and it was a specific plane designed to it was the opposite shape of that, and so they could always plane that sole to be that shape every time. Um, but if you just need to make one off to make a particular profile, you just carve the shape, which sounds ridiculously complicated to us, but for someone who knows their way around a couple gouges, it's 20 minutes worth of work and it's done. Uh, really is not that complicated of a thing. Um, you just take it down to shape. And so I, I do want to show that someday because it really isn't that difficult. 
Um, when they make hollows and rounds, um, they would have master or uh, mother um, hollows. Or they would have mother rounds. So they would be the radius that they would need to be. And so they would have a plane that would have different soles that they could swap on and off with a whole set of irons. And so they'd have all these radiuses, radii. Um, so they would have all the rounds. And they would make the hollows with the, the master rounds. And then they would take that hollow and then they would make the round um, so that you had a matching pair every time so that one half of the plane always made the other half of the plane. Um, but the first half of the plane was then made with the mother plane. Um, so, yeah, but it's really not that complicated to carve one. Um, fairly straightforward, so I'd like to show it off sometime, but not right now. What else we got? Uh, I keep forgetting to scroll up. What are we doing on time? 40? Oh, we're doing good. I was thinking it was late it was. We've got a lot of questions to get through. I'm ready. Throw them at me. Stop waxing elephants. <laughs> asks Richie asks, I have a wooden plane that I'm fixing up, and one of the things that hold the wedge in the plane is starting to break off, and I was wondering if there was a good way to fix this. One of the things that hold the wedge in the plane. Just reading. I think you're going to need to explain that further because generally you have... Let me show you this. Two. One. Two. Oh, it is on that one. <laughs> it switched. I didn't realize it. Um, I mean, because the only thing holding the wedge is the iron and the front side of the mouth. Um, I don't know what else there'd be. Unless you're talking about like a Krenoff style, which would be an open mouth plane where there'd be a pin going through, in which case that pin could be coming loose. Um, to fix that, you would just drive out the pin and, and put in a new pin. Um, but I don't know what else you would be having that would be coming loose. So um, ask that question further and we might be able to get back to you. Alrighty. Mr. Krabs, will you ever do a video on how to make your own varnish? Um, no, I'm not a big fan of varnish. Uh, I just, I would much rather use shellac than varnish. Um, I would much rather use poly than varnish. I'd much rather use a hard wax than a varnish. Uh, I don't really have any need for a varnish, so no. <laughs> um, I, maybe someday I'll, I'll, I'll show it, but it's not something I use, so it's not a topic I'm proficient on. Um, I, maybe I, I know my way around it in theory, but I've never, I've never experimented with it, so it's not, it's not something I, I feel really comfortable talking about, so I probably won't. But who knows? Maybe. What all else? right. Andrew McCarter asks, when building a workbench, do all six sides need to be flat and square or just the work surface? Keep in mind, I'm building one with aprons. Just the top. Just the top. I mean, honestly, in this one, um, the sides... Well, here, let's, let's find out. I have no idea if the sides of this are parallel to the top. Really doesn't matter. Well, here, let me show you on this camera. Two. Let's have a look. See here, this side is not at all flat, parallel to the top. I don't know if you can see that, but it's touching here, and it's like an eighth inch off over here. Um, so this this skirt is flared out that way a good ways. Um, let's see what it is over here. About the same back here. Um, yeah, this really doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not referencing anything off of this side at all. Now on the other side here, uh, two one. There you go. Um, on this side here, I am concerned that this surface is 90 degrees to the top. Although I'm not really concerned that it's 90. I, I checked it. In this case, yeah, this side's dead on. Um, nothing has moved on it. So this side is 90 degrees to the top. And I actually planed this face down to be 90 degrees when I made the top. And that's because a lot of times I'm clamping things along this face. Um, so my, my leg vise is here clamp that, that face is the other half of the vise. Um, and so I want that vise to be true and I want the top to be flat and true, but that's all that matters. Um, this side doesn't matter at all. The underside doesn't matter at all. That end, I never even planed smooth. That end's completely, the, the saw marks are still on it from when I cut it off. Um, I actually drilled holes in that end so that I can store my dogs in the end of the bench. So they're literally plugging out the end of the bench. Um, I'd show you that, but I, my camera cord won't reach around that far. Um, but yeah, it's the only thing that matters is the top and a side you're clamping to, if you're clamping to the face. 
and it, really there is no reason for the face to be perfectly 90 degrees to the top. I've never had any reason that it has to be. Um, yeah, and my, my bench is out of flat. I, I mean, if you were to flat, if you were to measure this thing out perfectly, there would be points on this bench that would probably be more than a sixteenth of an inch um, out of flat, so more than two millimeters um, from any point to any point. Um, but I mean, if, if you go in any, like this two foot by two foot area, there's nothing in this area except for a few gouge marks that are out of flat more than a sixty-fourth or so. Um, this is relatively flat here because this is where I do my work, but there really isn't a huge reason for the for the table to be flat um, any more than that. So people really get bent out of shape, and the whole thing's got to be thousands of an inch. Uh, it doesn't matter at all because it's wood; it's going to move, it's going to change. You're gonna you're gonna be working in one area and wearing it down more, and then over time, I may actually re end up reflattening this, which is completely normal. I can take a plane to it and take a, a few shavings off and bring it all down into flatness again. But it's wood, wood moves, so don't don't worry about it too much. What we got? All right, so we have clarification on Esther's question. It's a, it's a traditional wooden jack plane, and it's <clears throat> one of the things, which apparently is an abutment, um, on the side of the mortise that press the wedge against the iron. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, that one's rusted. We're not rusted. Here, let me, sh let me see and make sure what I'm talking about here. Uh, two. So in this one, you've got the wedge, and then you've got these two wings that stick out. Zoom in a little more. Focus. There we go. So you have these two wings that then hold the wedge. So you're probably talking about these um, coming loose. So I'm guessing you have a crack running from here down the, the face where it's actually splitting out the, the, the wing here. Um, or I'm trying to remember what that, there's a technical term for these. The um, just like, that sounds right. Just like this little cutout here is called the eye. The eye of the plane, why is that? I don't know. Um, so I mean, I'm guessing they're cracking out, in which case you have a couple choices. Number one, you can actually break them out and run the crack further, put glue in there and clamp the thing back together which if I think I can make that crack nice and clean, I may end up doing that. It's breaking um, off and raising up the body of the plane, he says. It's cracking off and raising it's up. It's breaking off and raising up the body of the plane. I don't know how it would be raising up the body of the plane, but I mean, usually the, the best answer is to break it off and then glue it back on. Um, it sounds really crazy, but it, it generally works. As long as when you break it off, you clean off all the fibers, because a lot of times there's little fibers that are sticking out and interfere when it goes back together. Break off the little fibers inside so you get nice clean surfaces when you glue it back together. And a lot of times you can get it back together and not even tell the difference. Um, other than that, the, the next option, <coughs> go back to one. Um, the next option is then to um, solidify it, in other words, um, putting it in um, uh, stabilization chamber. Um, and so you can actually like epoxy it back together and you would work the epoxy into the joint, clamp it up, from put it in the, the chamber and it'll actually suck that into the, the space. It's raising up from the body. I can't read. Ah, okay. Yeah, and that, um, most of the time I would, I would attempt to break it off and re-glue it on. Um, or at least break it off enough so that I can get a syringe in there with, um, with wood glue, work the syringe deep into the crack, and then clamp it back up. And that does pretty darn well. Um, I would generally use a thin epoxy that takes a day to set, and that thin epoxy will work back into the wood a little farther than wood glue will. Uh, and it's a little stronger than that, so that would be my choice. But regular tight bond or wood glue would do just fine. Just a little bit thicker, it's harder to get through a syringe. What's next? Oh, I forgot to scroll up. Hang on. Jack Beeson asked, what are your thoughts on a Stanley 50 plow and beading plane as opposed to other planes? <laughs> uh, the Stanley 50 is kind of the stripped down version of the Stanley 45. Um, and so just as the Stanley 45 is kind of the stripped down version of the Stanley 55, um, for 90 to 95 percent of the work I would do with a 45 or 55, the Stanley 50 <coughs> would do just fine. Um, and a lot of times they're a lot cheaper. 
So if you can find one of them, they're they're great to have. So yeah, um, I, I I don't have one. I actually haven't come across one at a decent price in a while, so I just haven't picked one up. Uh, but they're they're good plane. They're they're great for plowing. They're great for beating, and that's most of the things you're going to do with a 45 or 55. Um, so if that's all you're going to do, get a 50 and save you some money. And they're a lot easier to set up. A lot of le lot less things on them to to go wrong. What? Sorry, oh. I was reading something. La, la, la. <laughs> Tim BBQ, why are a bunch of your hand planes blue? Um, the ones that are blue are ones that I have completely restored. I've stripped them down. I've completely, uh, when I got them, they were boat anchors that were covered in rust and pitted. Um, and so I've either sandblasted them out or I've stripped the paint or I've taken them close down to most of the original paint. Um, and then repainted them. Um, and I repainted them because um, the Japaning that was originally on them is so far gone that it's just not worth keeping. Um, so the ones that are blue here were basically trash, um, unfunctional planes that I had to do a lot of work with them to get them back to where they are now. Um, but any, any tool that I do a complete restore on, I paint it blue because I like the look of blue. Um, and I'm going to be using it, and I like it, and therefore it's my plane. I'm going to do what I want to do with my plane. Um, if I'm making it for someone else, or if I'm restoring for historical quality, um, I'll use original Japaning, um, and you can make your own. It's it's not a difficult recipe. It's just uh, it's an old-fashioned type of paint, basically. Um, it's like a, a almost like making your own varnish. So maybe I should do a video on that and make my own varnish, but call it Japaning. <laughs> um, but I, I don't do a whole lot of that because most of the time when I make, when I restore something, I'm taking Excuse something me? that has no value because it's totally trashed, and I'm making it into something with value because it's something that I am, I'm, I'm using. I'm, it's something that I, I, I use on a daily basis. Um, so, and when I pass away and someone gets this plane then someone is going to know that that plane was in my use because it has that particular type of blue that I use that no one else does. Although now people have been asking me, what blue do you use? And apparently they're wanting to use it on their planes. So there are other blue planes out there now, not just uh, um, the British company. Okay, good. Oi. Oi, she says. Yeah, sorry, I'm fading. Uh, Jake Meadows, where do you find American beach blanks for plane building? And are there any more common woods other than beach that would work just as well? Oh, yeah. Um, most of the planes I make are out of white oak. I really like white oak. Um, as long as the grain is running in the right direction, white oak is a really good uh, plain wood. I mean, yes, it's more fractious and you got to take care of it a little bit better, but it, it wears really nicely. Um, gives a nice slick surface. I've used hickory a few times. Hickory is a good wood for it. Um, hard maple is probably the second choice for most plane makers. A lot of people really like making it out of hard maple. Um, let's see, what are some other ones? Um, a lot of people used to use elm, but elm is getting harder to find. Oh. Um, ash, I've seen quite a bit made out of ash. Uh, really, there is no bad wood for it. Um, it's just the softer it gets, usually the, the it doesn't last as long because the, the soles wear out faster. Um, the only reason beech is used is it's a very smooth wood. It's very creamy, um, and so it's easy to work with, but it is a very wear-resistant wood. It, it stands up really well to the, the test of time. So a lot of people consider it to be the best wood, um, but best doesn't mean that others are bad. So whatever you have. Go for it. Have fun. You can make your plane out of whatever you want to make it out of. You don't have to make it out of what people tell you to make it out of. What you got? Okay. So it's a 54. I don't think we're going to be able to go through all the questions that I got. Okay. Let's so, do what we can. And if I don't get to your question, um, either save it for next time or feel free to send it to me and I'll try and answer them there. We have them, I have them saved, so... I'm and I'll probably saying. stick around after the live and answer a couple on the text in the yeah. chat. So. Um, I'm just saying that if you throw up any new ones, they're probably not going to get answered. Yes. Because I've got probably at least 12 more. And probably only going to hit two or three more. Yeah. <laughs> what um, we got? Right. Um, I'm 
trying to see what... Where you left off. Well, left off slash... Want to answer? Biggest <laughs> questions. Um... We have a lot of wood, like where to get, where you get wood, best places to buy wood. So I think that's a question um, that we should. Wood in general, I have several videos on where I find wood. Um, I go to a lot of local Sawyers. One of my favorite places is on Craigslist. Local Sawyers are, you know, Bim, Jim Bob, who has a, uh, has a wood miser, and he mills up a half dozen logs a year. And I'll go out to his place, and he'll be like, yeah, I milled up this white oak a couple years ago. I will milled up that, that walnut a couple years ago, and it's... You know, a buck fifty for the walnut, and you know, fifty cents for the white oak, and I'll buy up a whole supply of whatever random stuff they had milled up. Um, that's where I, I like to get a lot of my stuff. I, I get a lot of it on Craigslist. I've only shopped at a um, an actual lumber yard a couple times, um, but I have several videos on where to get cheap and free wood, or I have some videos on how to split your own wood so you can actually make your own lumber. Um, so there, there are lots of possibilities like that. So. Definitely check, take a look at those videos. Mm. <laughs> hmm. She's thinking. I know. I can see the smoke from here. Shut up. get paid enough to do this job that's all i'm gonna say you get paid I, that's my point <laughs> um okay so there was a big discussion in the chat after this question so i'm gonna go with this one no miller says is it me being a complainer is it impossible to do fine joinery in extreme heat like the upper 90s in a humid climate Ugh. i find it impossible to focus when sweat is falling down my face yes um yeah there's a reason that my shop is in my basement because it's air conditioned and it's a good temperature all year round. It is phenomenal. I suggest anyone do a basement shop, especially if you're hand tool woodworking. It's really not much of a problem at all to have it in the shop, in the basement, because the, the, the dust is minimal and curls don't travel quite as much. Um, although my wife occasionally notices stuff gets dragged into the laundry room, um, but uh, it's, it's really not that much of a problem. Um, but yes, um, particularly for me, heat is horrible. Uh, for joinery, not to mention just getting in my eyes and driving me crazy, um, but uh, it wood when the humidity changes wildly, it wood expands and contracts. And if you've ever perfectly planed up a piece of wood and you've left it overnight and you come back to it, all the dimensions have changed slightly because um, it's absorbed more moisture or released more moisture or tension has been let loose. Um, and so anytime you're in those wild changing temperatures, um, you're going to have wood movement. And sometimes that makes it very difficult for fine detailed joinery. So, yes, I feel your pain. <laughs> okay, just because I wanted to know this answer when I asked this one. Brad's workbench asked, what would you do if YouTube wasn't around anymore? Um, I would probably go to whatever channel took its niche because... There are so many people clamoring for it that there would be other channels that would do the same thing. And there are several other um, there are several other websites that do very similar things. They're just not as big. So yeah, there are other things to, to do. Um, but I guess you're asking what business would I do? Um, I would probably start a woodworking um, school. I think that would be a lot of fun to do a physical school. But uh, yeah, not right now. <laughs> Time for one more? Uh, Just about one more. She's looking to see which one is most valuable. Which one does well, she pick for the last question? Well, a lot of these you've question. done videos on, and that's why it's kind of like... Yeah. Yeah, if you're ever looking for a, a question on did I do a video on it, if you go to YouTube and you type in wood by right and whatever your topic is, you'll find the videos that I've made on that topic. And uh, it's a pretty easy way to find... Um, things about it. All right. Um, so Nightcast Cactus X, do you have any issues with tool rust in your area? How do you protect your tools? I, it's kind of on one of your videos, I think. But. Yeah, I did an entire video on rust prevention. Um, and so if you want to see that, but I don't have a huge amount of issue with it. Again, I'm in the basement. It's air conditioned in here. 
um, relative humidity all year round, relative temperature all year round. Um, humidity is just not uh, not a huge option, for, not a huge issue for me. Um, but for most times, even when I did have a garage shop, um, oil and wax do phenomenal things as long as you keep the surfaces oiled and waxed. And the more rust prone your area is, the more common you have to do, the more regular. Uh, there's some people that every time they use a tool, they oil and wax it before putting it away. And that means you actually have to put it away rather than leaving it on the bench. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, having a regular plan in place for oiling and waxing is, is pretty much the, the, the big key. So, yeah. Uh, nine o'clock. I think that's about it. So if I didn't get to your question, uh, I'll try and answer a few of them in the chat after this closes. Or feel free to send me a message and I'll try and answer them there. Um, I do regularly get questions on emails and I try and answer as many of those as I can. But uh, I think that'll about do it for now. Am I missing anything? Uh, well, we just had a question come in about trying to find a tool show in Tool Clubs in California, and I couldn't remember the oh, name of your yes. website. Um, well, if you want to go to handtoolfinder.com. That's what it was. Handtoolfinder.com is a site that I've put together that is every known place I know of to buy hand tools. And I have a map of the entire world with pins all over the place for antique stores that are known to have hand tools, entire stores that are devoted to antique hand tools, tool meets. Um, but particularly in California, there is a group called um, PAST, P-A-S-T, um, Pacific Area Tool Collectors. No, P-A-S, something like that. Um, but it's a, a hand tool collecting community devoted to the California area. And they usually have three or four meets in California each year. Um, so yeah, there's one in California. Colorado, there's one in the Pacific Northwest, um, there's one in the Northeast, uh, there's a Southern Tool Collectors, there's a Canadian Tool Collectors, there's an Australian Tool Collectors, there's, there's like a good dozen or so, and I have them all listed on that site, handtoolfinder.com. Um, so if you want to find tools, go to handtoolfinder.com and that will help you out, as well as I have a, a huge list of online tool collectors, so uh, online tool sellers. Um, and a lot of times if I'm looking for a particular tool, I'll just go down the list and ask them and say, hey, do you have one? Hey, do you have one? Hey, do you have one? And then one of them will pop up and say, yeah, I just got one of those in. Um, so definitely um, a, a great resource if you're looking for a particular tool. Are you still working on putting some people, putting some things on the map? Yes, yeah. If you have something that's not on the map, send it to me and I'll put okay. it on the map. That's well, how most things have gotten on there. Um, and anytime I'm out traveling around, I try and hit as many of those spots as I can just to, to verify. And if you do go to something that's on the map and say, yeah, there really wasn't anything there, let me know. Um, but it, most all of the locations on the map are, are things that people have told me about or places I've heard about uh, but actually haven't been to. So. You didn't listen to the, what I was saying. What? I said this person sent you things and you still haven't put them on the map. Really? Do they want? Do you want them to resend? Yeah, send it again. If I didn't get it on there, um, okay, please cool. do so. Resend them. The please. the best way to do it is send it on my email. Um, go to woodbywrite.com and put it in the contact form. Because if it's in my email, it's my to do list, and it's very rare that something falls off of that list. But if you send me through something through social media, it's very easy for that to get lost, and I don't I don't get it. So um, definitely send me an email, and I'll try and get it on the. So we're yeah. only giving away strop for posting that live. Oh, we need to do a live. Yes, let's do a live strop giveaway. Okay. So if you're still here, if you're still here, you are having a much better chance because I'm sure a lot of people have disappeared off the list. So we're going to give away a strop tonight, and we are going to give it away for um... man. I should have thought of this ahead of time. Um... Wow, I haven't thought of a good question yet. If I could live in any state in the United States, what state would I live in? First person to put up the right state in the comments um, wins this strop. So yes, what state would I live in? Um, and I've lived in nine different states. Moved 25 times, so I've, I've actually gotten a chance to, to see a few. Um, here, here, here. here. <laughs> Some people are still here. <laughs> the Who's in Whoville. Like I logged in on the last minute. That's right. <laughs> now I see smoke over there. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>! <laughs>
Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin, Colorado, South Dakota, California. Colorado's Hawaii. close. Colorado's no, second Alan, on my list. That would be me. Hawaii's first on Sarah's list, Tis, even though she hasn't Tennessee, been there. Tennessee, Canada. <laughs> Texas, Michigan, Wisconsin's Georgia, Wisconsin's fourth, Florida, Michigan's third. Alaska. Alaska's first. Tim, Tim Cheatwood. Cheatwood. You must have had a conversation with that man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, send me information and I'll get you a, uh, a strop in the mail. And, uh, yes, Alaska is top of my list. Um, yeah, Alaska, then Colorado, then Michigan, then Wisconsin, then probably Washington um, or Oregon. Those two are pretty close. So, Montana's pretty good, too. But yeah, um, I think that'll about do it for this week. Anything okay. I'm forgetting? So, after this video is posted. Yes, after this video is posted, wait until it goes actual live. Not this live, but when it comes up. Um, and put in um, suggestions for what we should do next week or the weeks coming after. If you have a project that'll take more than one week. And I will pick one of them to do. And whatever that project is, that person will win a strop. So, looking forward to it. Let me know. And I think that's about it for this week. I guess I didn't win the state of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> that's the state I live in. That's the state he currently lives in. <laughs> <laughs> I've never left that state. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thanks for watching. And until next time, have a wonderful day. I think I gotta find the button. Button finding time is 